time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Just as you are before your God, oh, come. Come, and now is the time to worship. Come, and now is the time. Just as you are to worship, come. Just as you are before your God, and one day every knee will confess you are God, and one day every knee will bow. And still, the greatest treasure remains for those. Gladly choose you now. Yes, and one day every tongue will confess you are God, and one day every knee will bow. And still, the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Oh. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Um, continuing in our series of John, um, First Love. And be sure to check in this morning while you're with us. And whether you're here in person or join us online, let's stand together as we begin our service. Um, let's stand and pray these words. From Psalm 19, it'll be responsive, so you read the yellow. Let's join our hearts together this morning in prayer. Come into the sacred space to worship God. His directions are sure. Come into this holy place to worship God. His commandments are clear. His judgments are true. Come with holy fear to be given life, to be made wise, to have your heart stirred and your eyes opened wide. Come, let us worship God. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Amen. Sing with us. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
come into your presence. We acknowledge your presence in this place. You are here with us. We thank you for calling us to worship together. Open our mouths and the words, open our mouths and our hearts shall proclaim your praise. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Lord, open our hearts as we receive your word this morning. We pray through Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Uh, boy, we got some cool stuff this morning to unpack in John's gospel. I do want to mention, if uh, you'd be willing to, uh, to check in. Go to trylakeside.com and tell us how we can pray for you. And uh, I know more than uh, a few people need prayer. So last week there was like seven prayer requests. I'm like, come on, church, you know, like uh, let us pray for you and tell us uh, how we can pray for you and, and what's going on. And, uh, but please take a moment and do that sometime today. Uh, one of the coolest words in the English dictionary is eureka. And so during the gold rush era, when gold was discovered along the coast of California, settlers, these companies came and they formed a settlement and they named it Eureka, Eureka. So Eureka is what you shout when you become aware of that all your hopes and dreams are about to come true, Eureka. And so, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a, a lot of things that are called Eureka. There's a vacuum company called Eureka. Uh, you know, the marketing people at that place are probably like, you know, I think people are looking for the vacuum of their dreams. Let's call it Eureka. Uh, there's a college called Eureka College. There's casinos that are called Eureka Casinos. You know, ka jackpot, Eureka. The, uh, restaurants, a data company. You know, you ever trying to find that one little file that's somewhere, that picture or whatever. There's a data mining company called Eureka. They'll help you find it. Uh, there's a TV show uh, called Eureka. It's about a small town where these government folks or whatever, these great minds, they come together and they make famous discoveries and inventions. Never watched it, but Eureka, that word 
pops up in a lot of different places. Long before Eureka was an English word, it was a biblical word. It's a Greek word. It's a transliteration of a Greek word. Eureka is what the woman in Luke 15 screams when she finds her lost coin. She turned her whole house upside down looking for this coin. And then when she finds it, she says, Eureka, I have found it. It's what the shepherd exclaimed when he left the 99 and went off on the hillside to find that one lost sheep. It's what the father said when his son was reunited with him. He saw him on a distant horizon. He came, he threw a party, and the the elder brother couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. And the father says, Eureka, this brother of yours that was lost has been found. And what did Jesus say in Luke 19, 10? He said, the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Eureka is what all of heaven exclaims. It's what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit jubilantly shout when just one person turns their eyes back toward God. Eureka. So I thought, you know, we need to, we need to uh, say this word, right? Eureka. I'm going to give you permission to, to shout this word. Like you just found gold. No. You found something better than gold. Eureka. Ready? One, two, three. Eureka. Eureka. Ah, you know, you might have found, you know, a, a shirt or something that got lost in the closet with that. that that's not, let's try again. Now, you, you, you found something. All your hopes and dreams are going to come true because you just eureka something. So, you ready? One, two, three. Eureka! Ah. <laughs> anyway. I mean, how, how loud would you shout that word? Like, what's the thing? That your life is so built around that if you were to discover it, you would scream that even ten times louder. What is that thing? There was somebody that titled the Gospel of John, but especially John chapter 1, the Eureka chapter. And I have to confess, I didn't connect all those dots. But sometimes when you look at a text and you get down to the, the Greek and you're really digging into a text, like I was doing it this week, I was like... I know there's, there, there's all these things that can be mined out, but in the Greek, there's that word eureka. It appears in this chapter. And I never realized it, but John chapter 1, uh, you have more names and titles and statements being made about Jesus in John chapter 1. You got more stuff introducing Jesus being jammed into this one chapter than you have in, in probably any other chapter of your Bible. Do you realize that? You know, we're so accustomed to reading it, We don't realize all the things that are being introduced about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Eureka! You know, this is the the answer to life. This is a a theory of everything. This is is as as good as it's ever going to get. You know, the Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were created through Him. In Him was life. That life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness. You know, the light gives light that gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. The Word was becoming flesh and, and tabernacling and, and dwelling among us. And, and Jesus is the one and only Son from the Father who's come full of grace and truth. And, and no one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he's come to exegete and to reveal and to make the invisible God known to us. I mean, if that doesn't get you your blood excited that doesn't spark something in you that doesn't churn up a little eureka moment in your spirit like there's something wrong with you (laughs) you know maybe you're just so dead that the ekg you know there's not even a little blip you know when you read about the eureka of john one if john one is true and if everything that john is telling us about jesus is true this is indeed jesus is indeed the Eureka of all Eurekas. Like nothing compares to this. So in John 1, Jesus is introduced as Messiah, prophet, Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God, the one who has come to baptize with the Spirit, the chosen one of God, the rabbi, teacher, master, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. He's the son of Joseph. He's a Nazarene which has significance. 
uh, in Old Testament times, the Son of God, he's the King of Israel, the Son of Man, which was uh, the name that, that Daniel gave to the one who is promised to come. He said the Son of Man will come. So these phrases and ideas and, and statements are just stacked one on top of another. You go through the whole chapter, you can make a list, you can fill up a whole page with just the titles of Jesus. And so we ended last week with John 1, 35 and 36, and, and we're going to start there this week. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, behold, see, the Lamb of God. Here he is, the Lamb of God. This is the one, the Lamb of God. Think of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis, preparing the wood, building the fire, preparing the altar, and Abraham has been commanded by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, which, okay, he binds Isaac, and, and Abraham is about to sacrifice his one and his only son, and in Genesis 22, 7, it says, Isaac says to his father, he says, Father, my father, and the father says, here I am, my son, and Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know, if this lamb doesn't show up, I die, but, but where's the lamb? My father, where's the lamb? And that's the question that hangs over all of the Old Testament, all of Old Testament history, all of Hebrew history, all of Judaism, for thousands of years, started with Abraham. Where is the lamb? But then, Eureka, there he is. He's in the bush. This ram got caught in the bush, and, and God provides a ram, and it's a blood sacrifice, a substitute for Isaac. And Isaac is spared, and the lamb, its blood is shed as a substitutionary atonement for Abraham's son, Isaac. You talk about a eureka moment. If you were Isaac, how would you say eureka? Eureka. You don't know. When, when God's righteous anger burned against the Israelites because of their stubbornness and rebellion, something we unpacked last week, the Israelites are in the wilderness and you know, they're camping out, and they got the tabernacle in the middle, and they're, they're all camped out. A million people, I mean, think about a million people camping together. <laughs> You're talking about an enormous uh, camp. And, and God was so angry at their stubbornness and rebelliousness and their grumbling and all these things that his fire comes down from heaven and literally consumes the edges of the camp. And, and God is so enraged at their stubbornness. He invited them out of Egypt into the wilderness to worship him. But they were complaining. They were saying, we'd rather have died back in Egypt than be here with you, God. And, and, and God's, God's enraged that, that they, they have that attitude after all he'd done for them. And the priests, they sacrificed lambs as a blood sacrifice, as a substitute for the sins of Israel to atone. That God's wrath would be deflected and they might live. And this idea of a lamb deflecting by its own very life, by its own shed blood, deflecting what man deserves is your entire Old Testament. The, the lamb would die, but then Israel would live. And, and, and all of the stuff you read in the Old Testament, it, it's really just a dry rehearsal for that moment when God would send forth his true lamb. A lamb from heaven who would once and for all atone for, for the sin of sinful mankind. And, and, and God said that the body of that lamb would be broken and, and his blood shed and, and his body nailed to a cross. And, and he'd become a curse and he would take the punishment that was on us and, and so that we would be free of the curse. And we'd be free of that punishment and free of that wrath. And, and we'd be set free to, to have life and life everlasting. That promise hangs over all of history Leading up to what we read in John chapter 1. Where is this Lamb of God? Where is this Lamb of God? Isaiah the prophet had a lot to say about this Lamb that was going to come from heaven, this Lamb of God. Uh, Isaiah 9. Just make a note of it. Write it down. Isaiah 9. Just go look at it later. 
The people walking in darkness will see a great light. A light's going to dawn. Their oppressive yoke, the rod that's on the shoulders, the, the staff of their oppressor is going to be smashed. You know, God is going to come and things are going to be set into motion that are going to transform the whole world. Kingdoms and, 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 and rulers and authorities for, for all time. The Lamb is coming. The King is coming. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. A child will be born to us. A son's going to be given to us. The government's going to be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. All divine titles, by the way. His dominion will be vast. His prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom. He will establish and sustain justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of the armies is going to accomplish this. That's Isaiah. Writing hundreds of years before the Lamb shows up. A king is coming. And he is going to usurp all things and establish his everlasting kingdom on the throne of David. Isaiah 11. A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse. You know, an, an offspring will come from the lineage of Jesse. A, a branch will come and form from this stump of Jesse, from the throne of David, and his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And, and this, this one will delight in the fear of the Lord. Well, well who is going to be this spirit-anointed one that, that Isaiah is talking about that's going to come and, and save all of Israel and bless all? All the earth. Isaiah 53. Who has believed what we've heard? Like, we've heard it so much, maybe we're just so familiar with it, we just shrug our shoulders and it doesn't spark in us like it should. We've heard it so many times. But, but Isaiah says, who, who's going to believe what we've heard? And, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he describes the coming lamb. He says, he grew up before God like a young plant, like, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or a majesty that we should look at him. He didn't have any appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. We didn't value him. And yet, he himself bore our sickness. He carried our pains. And we in turn regarded him as stricken, struck down from God, afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was put on him. And we are healed, but he's wounded. We all went astray like sheep, like Israel, stubborn, rebellious, grumbling. Uh, God, just take us now because it, it, it was better that we be slaves than than be here to worship you in the wilderness and we all went astray like sheep we all turned our own ways and the Lord has decided to punish him for the iniquity of all of us huh. he was oppressed and afflicted he didn't open his mouth like a lamb led to a slaughter like a sheep that's silent before her shears he didn't open his mouth he was taken away because of oppression and judgment and who considered what his fate would be? He was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave among the wicked, but he was with a rich man in death because he had done no violence and he had not spoken deceitfully. Yet, the Lord was pleased. The Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. A lamb is going to be crushed for you all. The Lord's pleasure, it is his pleasure that this lamb get crushed in order to save you. And, and his pleasure will be accomplished, is what Isaiah says in Isaiah 53. And after this anguish he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. And therefore I will give him the many 
as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. You know who the rebels are? Us. You know who the rebels are? Israel. Isaiah 53, the Lamb of God is going to come and he's going to be crushed and he's going to bear your penalty for your sin, for your iniquity. So I'm just showing you that, that lingering over all of history up to this moment in John 1 is there is a Lamb of God that's coming through whom God is going to accomplish great things. But who is he? We're not going to recognize him because he's so ordinary in some ways, in appearance. There's nothing about him that is attractive that you're going to desire. But what he's going to do is going to change the whole world. Who is this lamb? It's sad that the Jewish people still are asking, who is this lamb? Though Christ has come, they didn't recognize him. They rejected him. But he came. He was too ordinary, maybe. But what he did was extraordinary. So here's John. And John wouldn't have recognized him either. Except for the one who sent John baptized and told him that as you baptize, you're going to recognize him. Not by his appearance, but by the fact that the Holy Spirit is going to descend on him. So the next day, John is standing with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, There he is! That's him. That's the one I told you that was before. It's greater than me because he was before me. There he is. For a hundred generations or however many, people longed for the lamb to appear. And this is their eureka moment. What a powerful invitation. Look, see, behold, the lamb of God. At the end of the day, your allegiance isn't to some preacher. It's not to some organization or church. At the end of the day, your allegiance isn't to some preacher. It's not the preacher's image that you need to behold. You know, uh, it's not his personhood that you're owed your allegiance. The preacher's essential work is to cry out to people, behold the Lamb of God. The preacher's essential work is not to become a focal point, but to establish a focal point outside of himself, beyond himself. And that's exactly what John does here. Behold the Lamb of God. If a, if a sermon accomplishes what happens in these short words, the shortest sermon that you can preach is, look, <laughs> look, you, look, <laughs> right? Because people, they want, they, they want a, a point to fixate their attention. And you can make yourself a show or you can point them to the revelation, Jesus. And and this is the shortest sermon, look, the Lamb of God. You know, people come to Christ maybe through us, preachers, but they don't come by us and they certainly don't come to us. They have to come to the Lamb. They have to go to the Lamb. It's by his blood that you have life everlasting. And so none of you should suppose uh, that because a preacher shouts, behold, that your work is done either, right? Like my job is to say, look, but just because I say, look, you shouldn't imagine that your part's done, that you've, you've heard this sermon and now you can go on about your way. It's now up to you to raise your eyes and to actually obey this command. This is a command, look, see, behold. You know, what you love is what you give attention to. I can tell what you love by what you spend your attention on, or who or what. And it's now you must do the beholding. Uh, And no one can do your beholding for you. You must see and, and you must worship for you, for God. You have to take that baton. And now it's it's you that that has to work things out before the living God. Behold. So, John 1, 37 through 39, the, the disciples, they heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. You know? Uh, that's, that's a good reminder that we, are, we serve a purpose, 
And once a person is attached to Jesus, they belong to Jesus. They don't belong to me or you or, you know, you're a parent and you have all godly offspring when your children are attached to Jesus. They're his children. And, and they follow Jesus. And it's kind of a bittersweet thing because, yeah, you know, you love to be with people, but man, the real goal is that there'll be, people will be with Jesus. And so they follow Jesus. And when Jesus turned, it, when, when this happened, Jesus turned and he noticed that they were following him and he asked them, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And uh, so they asked him a question uh, here in return. Where are you staying? I think there's another verse there. Uh, Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and they saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. This is such an amazing moment. Romans 10, Paul says, how will people hear if Christ isn't preached? How will they hear if Christ isn't preached? These two disciples heard, and they followed Jesus. And it's such an amazing thing. The, the, the split second that they leave John and begin to follow Jesus, do you notice what the text says? It says Jesus turns and notices them. It's instantaneous. The moment that they attach to Jesus, he turns and he's fully aware and notices them. And, and that's an incredible thing to contemplate because think about this, that the creator God of the universe is instantly aware the moment that we begin to seek him. God sees you, and he sees me. And he saw these two disciples the moment that they turned their eyes toward him. And Jesus asked them a very important question, and it's a question that he asked all of us, and it's a question not to be taken lightly. He asked, what are you looking for? What are you Seeking. A new vacuum sweeper, anybody? There's a new, there is a vacuum sweeper that I got to tell you about. Eureka. Now that's a vacuum. Eh. Uh, anybody looking for a better data service? You have some lost files, anybody? Eureka. That, that's where you need to go. Uh, anybody uh, need some new gizmos or technological gadgets to improve your life? You know, Eureka. Now that's a, that's a series to watch if you, you know want to get into inventions and whatever else. Anybody looking for knowledge? Eureka. Now, there's a college that will change the course of your life. Uh, anybody want to hit a jackpot? Let me tell you about a casino. Eureka. Anybody need some gold? Inflation, what is it? 30%? I don't know what it is. That might be somebody's approval rating, but, you know, Eureka. Go to Eureka, California. That's where the gold is. So, what is it that you are seeking? You know, uh, these disciples know what they're looking for. Do you know what you're looking for? Your whole life is fixated around something that excites you, that captivates you, that enamors you. What is it? These disciples immediately recognize Jesus' authority. They say, Rabbi, teacher, master, you know, where are you staying? <laughs> and they realize that Jesus isn't just someone that you can be transactional with. That to really know Jesus, that you need to spend time with Jesus. You know, come and see, okay? Follow Jesus. But they realize we really need to stay with Jesus and remain with Jesus. They're at the end of the workday. It's 4 o'clock, and, and the day's just starting for them because they have found the one they've been looking for, the God of Israel, the coming king, the Messiah, the Lamb of God. And, and they would need to log some hours with this one, the Lamb of God. They were willing to log an evening, days, lifetime. I don't think Jesus rewards casual engagement too well, do you? I don't think he rewards casual curiosity. And I think if you have casual curiosity, you're just kind of casually engaging God and it's just kind of an afterthought and maybe you do it once in a while and you do it when you feel like you need, like once a month, you know, once every few months, maybe I'll go online, maybe I won't. 
If you're casual about this thing, you're probably going to still be looking. Jesus says, what is it that you guys really want? What is it that you want to Eureka? If it's the Lamb of God that you want to Eureka, I'll show you where I'm staying. Come and see. Seek and you will find. That's what God says. Seek and you will find. You know, like, seek God as, as hard as you would seek a lost coin. Seek God as, as, as hard as you would seek a lost lamb. Seek God as hard as you would seek a lost son. Seek and you will find. But if you're casual about it, you'll probably stay lost. You'll probably stay lost. And they spent the whole day with Jesus. So we don't know who was with Andrew. It might have been John. You know, the gospel writer John has a way of making himself like cellophane. He doesn't ever say his name. He doesn't say, that was me. But it's probably Andrew and John that were the first two that came to Jesus. And, and John doesn't ever say his own thing directly, even later on, you know, the one whom God loved. Well, he doesn't say his name, but, you know, John's in the story, the writer's in the story, but he's not making himself the focal point because he gets the gospel that the focal point ought to be not me or my story or what, it's him. I got to behold the lamb. So, so Andrew, Simon's brother, he was one of the two uh, who was there. And he heard John say, behold the Lamb of God. He followed Jesus. The first thing he did was he went and found his brother Simon. And he told Simon, we have eureka we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to meet Jesus. And when Jesus saw him, he said, you're Simon. You're the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when it's translated means Peter, means rock. Andrew had a eureka moment, and his first order of business is he goes and he finds his brother Simon so that Simon can have a eureka moment. You see, that's how I think evangelism is the real tell, don't you think? That if you have really eureka'd what you have looked for your whole life, and if your eureka is really God, you're going to tell people about God, and you're going to bring people to God. A church that doesn't evangelize is really a spiritually dead church. If you have never brought anyone to Jesus your whole life, you know, you have to kind of do some assessment. You have to ask yourself, is God really my focal point? Is he really the one I'm looking for? Because you call everybody up and tell them about all the other stuff you've eureka'd. So so Simon, guess what? Guess what? We have found the Messiah. Now, there's something that's interesting that's going on in this John chapter 1. In Genesis, one of Jacob's sons' name, remember Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? One of Jacob's sons' name was Simon. And Simon and his brother Levi, ruthlessly, kind of rashly, impulsively, you remember they avenged the violation of their sister, and uh, they created this huge situation and this mess because they took justice in their own hands, and they went and waylaid a guy that violated their sister. And so in in Jacob's family in Israel, Simon was a very rash and impulsive person. And in the gospel, Simon reflects some of that same rashness. You remember when the temple guard soldier came to take Jesus and he whips out his sword and and cuts off the ear of the temple guard guy and and Jesus has to restore the guy's ear? But but what Jesus tells Simon, he's like, I'm going to make you a rock. I'm going to make you a stable, steady, trustworthy. I'm going, to, I'm going to transform your identity and your very personality and make you my instrument. That's what he tells Peter. Peter was probably just, you know, pushing against all the goads. Like he, was, he was ready to, you know. He's like, I'm going to make you a rock. You're kind of <laughs> unstable. You know, that's kind of what he says to Peter. God can change a man like that. So, I mean, he says something different to every person that meets him. I can, I'm going to make you a rock. Yeah, Simon, ah, that rock, Cephas. John 1, 43 through 51, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, which means the house of fishing. Sounds like a cool place to go. The hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel. See, that's what I'm talking about. If you've really eureka something, 
that matters and is of substance, who have you told about it? Who have you talked to about it? All of these people just organically and naturally go and evangelize. You don't have to be trained. They just go and do it. Like, I found the one. And so here, you know, Philip gets Nathaniel and, and tells him, we have found the one that Moses <laughs> wrote about in the law. And, and, and so did also the prophets like Isaiah. We've, we found the dude. Jesus, he's the son of Joseph. He's, from, he, he's a Nazarene. He's from Nazareth of all places. Like, <laughs> specific. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. And, you know, he's a proud Jewish person. And, you know, come and see, Philip. He said, come and, just come and see. You know, like, you have no excuse. Like, oh, what if people ask me questions? What if they bring up this or that? All you have to do is say, come and see, right? Like, it's the easiest one-liner. It's not even a tweet. It's like, come and see. Like, I don't know. Like, come and check it out. And so, uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth, can anything good come? Come and see is what Philip told him. Philip's testimony, you know, we found the one that Moses was writing about in the law. You know, Deuteronomy 18. I read it over the last couple of weeks. I'm not going to read it again, but like one like Moses is going to come. And he's going to come from God. He's going to be of God and he's going to lead God's people. He's going to be, he's going to continue what Moses started. How did John introduce Jesus? You know, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth, like something better is coming through Jesus. Well, when is that coming, God? The Jewish people read the law like crazy. They read the prophets and they read the Psalms and they were waiting. We found the one written about in the prophets. Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53. I would say if you want a clear picture of what people were waiting for, go read Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53. Just as a sampling, go read Deuteronomy 18. In, in John 5, a little bit later, we're going to get to this. Jesus is talking to some Pharisees. These were people that, that spent their life pouring over the scriptures. They knew the law, the prophets, the Psalms. They knew it all. They memorized it. They knew it inside and out. And Jesus says to some Pharisees, he says, you pour over the scriptures because you think that by them you're going to find eternal life. And yet here's what you're missing. The scriptures testify about me. But you're not willing to come to me so that you can have life. The scriptures testify about me. Me, Nathaniel, filled with Jewish pride. You know, Philip is a fisherman, and he knew about, there, there was such a, a saturating education back then that even fishermen knew about the Lamb of God in Isaiah. They knew about the law. They knew about Moses. They knew about all this stuff. They were so thoroughly educated, right? Here's Nathaniel, thoroughly consumed with the arrival of this one that was promised of God, filled with Jewish pride, a man of the word. And, and Philip's testimony is Eureka. We found the one that is written about in Moses and the law and the prophets. He's the son of Joseph. He's from Nazareth. Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. See, that's what I can't do for you as a preacher. That's what the evangelist can't do for the one that he is evangelizing. And it's what God doesn't do for us. Like, you have to come and do the seeing and beholding. And you have to seek to find. Seek and you will find. It's a promise. But you got to do it. Verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. And he said about him, you know, like, here he, here he is coming at a distance, and he says, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel says, how do you know me? How do you know me from anybody else? And he says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things 
than even that. This is quite a profound interaction. Let me, I got to break this down. He addresses, first of all, Nathaniel as a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Do you remember who Israel was? Who, whose name, who got the name change and became Israel? Who was that guy? Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob was a man of trickery. And you might remember that, that Israel was the name given to Jacob because God was going to change who Jacob was. Jacob was a deceiver, and he renamed him Israel because, just like Simon, he was going to give Simon a new identity. God was going to transform Simon into Peter, into the rock. God was going to change Jacob the deceiver into a man on whom he would fulfill his most profound blessings of promise, sending forth the Christ. Of Jacob's descendants, a Christ Messiah would come, a lamb of God. In Genesis, Jacob had to lie. He didn't have to, but he did. He, he lied and cheated and deceived his way to blessing, which is what a lot of people do. The, the, the means justifies the end. So, so he had to steal God's blessing because he didn't think he could have God's blessing, and he wanted to steal it. But here is a Jacobite, an Israelite. All right, you see what Jesus is doing? Here is a true on deceptive Jacobite. Here is a true on deceptive Israelite. And in whom there's no deceit. He is not like his ancestor Jacob. That's what Jesus is saying as this guy's coming up. He's like, hey, he's from Jacob and he's of Jacob, but he's not like Jacob. He's got a different heart than Jacob. He's got something different. So, so day after day, here's what the reality is. And by the way, Jacob uh, did seek God, and that's when he became Israel. When, when Jacob sought after God, that's when he gets the name Israel. And so here's Nathaniel, and he's been seeking God out under some fig tree. A fig tree was a place of study and, and deep meditation. And, and short of air conditioning, the shade of a fig tree was where you would go. Is one of the most comfortable places you could go if you needed to log some time with God and you wanted to really just be before him. You wanted to recline and, and have the word. And that's what Nathaniel's habit was. You know, so the fig tree, there's a lot of significance to fig trees in scripture. We'll get to that later. But, uh, but the fig tree is not the issue. The issue is, is that he was in a particular place meditating on God, beholding God in the wording. And, God, and Jesus says, but while you were beholding God, I was beholding you. While you were beholding me, I was beholding you. You know, what did Jesus say? You know, if you go into secret, a secret place, a closet, and you pray that God, God will see you, <laughs> nobody else can see it. You know, you're not doing it for the audience of men, but there is an audience, and God says, I see you when you pray. So only God could really be aware of what was going on. Only God himself could be aware of what was going on under that fig tree. Let me give you an example. One of the things that I do is I'll get on my, I'll get in my bass boat and I'll go out and fish. You know, at night. It's dark. Nobody can really see me out there. There's a boat, there's a little light, but nobody knows who it is. Except sometimes when I'm going across the water, the one of the ways you can tell it was me is like sometimes when I got my motor revved up, you know, and Mike, you've experienced that. I'll sing Amazing Grace as loudly as I can over the roar of my motor in the middle of the night on Lake Springfield. So if you ever hear somebody singing over the roar of a motor going across the water faster than the, the nighttime speed limit of 10 miles an hour, you know, it might be me. But other than that, you wouldn't know. Because one of the things I'll do is I'll go out to the very deepest water in the middle of the night under the stars and the full moon, and I'll just float. And it's there that I'll pray and cry out to God or lay before him, whatever. So imagine if I met somebody and they said, I saw you last night in your boat. Did you have night vision goggles? You know, that's what's going on here. I saw you under the fig tree. There's a famous uh, story, uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine describes him reclining under, he, he's, he's under a fig tree and he's seeking God and he says, I cast myself down. I know not how under a certain fig tree giving full vent to my tears in the floods 
of, of, of my, my eyes were gushing with tears. And, and he was under a fig tree, and, and that was a famous moment for Augustine, and he's seeking God. When have you ever cried your eyes out seeking to find the Lord of the universe? And what Jesus tells Nathaniel is, while you were searching hard after me, I've already, I'd already found you. I, I saw you under the fig tree. You were beholding me, but I was already beholding you. In the Greek, the word deceive is the same word for fish bait. So when you fish, you use bait to conceal the hook of what you really, really want. And so you have to trick the fish in order to catch the fish. And Jacob was a baiter. He was a deceiver. He had to trick his father and his brother, and he thought he had to trick God in order to get God's blessing. But what Jesus is telling Nathaniel is, you're not doing any trickery. You're not baiting. You, you just are authentically seeking me, and I see you just openly with all your heart seeking me, and I want you to know that I see you seeking me. I see you openly seeking me, your creator. And now here I am, seeking you will find. At once, Nathaniel confesses Jesus. He's, he, he, he doesn't even know, like, Rabbi, Master, the Son of God, and, and the King of Israel. He, like, he's putting all these things together, and he's realizing the, the grandeur of this one that's beholding him, that he's been trying to behold his whole life, and, and he's standing before the God of the universe, but the God incarnate in the flesh. And Jesus says, you're amazed because... I saw you in your private place. You're going to see even greater things than this. And this is what Jesus tells you. You remember uh, Jacob saw angels descending and ascending from heaven on a ladder? Remember that? Genesis 28. Well, Jesus says, you're going to see something greater, Nathaniel. You're going to see, you know, angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. One greater than Abraham is here is what Jesus will tell the Pharisees later on. One greater than Moses is here. We already heard that in John 1. One whose sandals you're not even worthy to tie. But what he's saying here is one greater than Jacob is here. One greater than Jacob is here. Behold your Christ, the Lamb of God, the King of Israel. Eureka! John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've observed his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace of truth. Don't you want to shout it? Eureka! John 1.18, no one's ever seen God. The one and only son who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He's revealed God! Eureka! I'm going to give you one more chance. I haven't got you on board yet. John 1, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And the people said, ah, that's about the same level as we started with. Maybe we got a ways to go. Dear Father, thank you for showing yourself to us, for coming as our Lamb to take away our sin. May we worship you with the heart of Nathaniel. May we draw near to you through Christ, we pray. Amen. As we respond to the word this morning by coming to the table, let's stand together hear these words from Psalm 139 that remind us who we are. Seen by God, known by God, uniquely formed by God. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You trace my journeys and resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. We acknowledge 
that Christ truly sees us and is present with us, we can't help but respond as Nathaniel does by saying, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. So as we celebrate communion here together, let's behold the Lamb of God as He is beholding us. And we take His body, the bread, give for us. Let's eat. take the cup, his blood, and pour it out for us. Let's drink and give thanks. Amen. Let's sing. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Let's sing this together. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. Yes, you are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. That's good news. I am chosen, not forsaken.
a couple things we want you to know about as we come to the end of our service this morning. There's a couple groups going on uh, that are starting up. Um, there's a sermon-based group, small group that uh, we want you to be involved in. There's also our student and kids groups that will be happening. Um, there's also some classes that are coming up real soon that we want you to get involved in. There's the Spiritual Disciplines of Jesus class. The Forgiving What You Can't Forget class, the Women's Study, the Financial Peace University, also the Art of Marriage. You can sign up for those at lakesidechristian.com slash groups. We'd love to have you a part of that. Or you can also go out in the lobby and sign up at the groups table. If you're new here or if you know someone who is new here, there's a starting point in lunch that we'll be doing next week after the second service, 1030 service. So go ahead and sign up for that. And there's also a pathway class starting on January 30th for those who are new with us. Um, as always, we have four different ways you can give. Um, and we appreciate uh, your sacrifice for that. As we close, we want you to know that uh, we want to pray for you, want to pray with you. And so at the close of this service, um, there'll be people at the front here who would love to, to pray with you um, after the service. As we close, hear this, let's join in this prayer of renewal. Would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are known, that we know you and that we are known by you. Truly, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. As we are sent from this place, help us to steward our thoughts and actions. May all that we do be pleasing to you and beneficial to our souls. By your grace, help us to extend that invitation of knowing you to those around us, friends, family, neighbors, and those in need. Renew the joy of being your disciples and help us to listen for your still small voice, leading and guiding us in all our ways. Through Christ our Lord we pray, amen. May God bless you and go in peace.